Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, HBRC C short course, Introduction to Python. Uh, we're gonna be covering uh, some of the basics of the language today. Um, uh, as far as HPRC goes, if you need assistance uh, on any of your uh, uh, accounts on the, our clusters, uh, we have our website where you can go to look up documentation. Uh, you can send an email to us at help at hprc.tamu.edu. Uh, telephone, I'm not sure if, if that's uh, being answered routinely. Normally it's gonna be quicker to uh, get to us through email. Um, and then when there are people in, uh, we have uh, people in Henderson Hall, which is near the, uh, the Life Sciences Building. <clears throat> okay, and when you do send us a, a help request, uh, it always helps to let us know which cluster you're talking about, because a lot of times people will say, I'm having a problem, and they don't, they don't let us know uh, if they're on Ada or Terra. Uh, let us know your net ID. Uh, if you're running jobs, uh, give us the job IDs if you have those. Um, the path names of in your job files, uh, which software you're using, which modules you've loaded, and if you can cut and paste the error messages, that's always helpful. All right, today what we're going to be working with is uh, starting here. Okay, we have uh, this material here. Um, this gives our agenda. And over here on the left under course materials, you have the Jupyter Notebook. You can download and save uh, the latest version of that. Um, we're gonna be running it online under the Google Colab system. Uh, we have uh, the slides that I was just going over here and the uh, notebook access instructions. So let's look at these. All right, um, okay, what we're gonna be using is a uh, system called Jupyter. It's a, uh, an integrated environment uh, that we can use on our web browser that allows us to, uh, uh, to, to provide information and also to uh, have snippets of code and to run those. Uh, we're going to be running this on the, the Google platform under Colab. So what you'll need to do uh, in order to use this, first of all, you'll need to be logged into a Google account. Uh, so I'll give you a chance to do that. As long as you're logged into a Google account, you should be able to uh, open up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the files that we're going to share with you. Um, normally, I use the uh, netid at temu.edu uh, Google account, uh, but you can also use your own private Google account if you wish. So let's start off by going to https colab.research.google.com. Okay, so what this does is it will, it will give you uh, an introductory screen. Uh, it will show you which uh, Jupyter Notebooks you've run recently. Uh, for most of you, that's gonna be uh, an empty list. It'll just have an, a welcome. You can, if you've saved a, a Google or a, um, the Jupyter Notebook to your Google Drive, what you can do is you can access it through here and, and you can see the, uh, the, the Jupyter Notebooks that I have saved there. But what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, make a copy from, uh, a notebook that I've uploaded to GitHub. And so what you're gonna do uh, to specify my username, which is K-J-T-A-M-U and hit enter. And there's only one repository here, which is intro to Python. And it's gonna show you the Python notebook here, this file. And over on the, uh, the right-hand side, there's a launch icon click this to open the notebook and it's gonna open it in a new tab. And so what this is gonna do, this is gonna initialize 
it, it will take a few minutes. All right, so this is a, an integrated environment. Um, the contents of this are broken up into cells. So you, you click on each cell and it changes the focus to the particular cell that you're looking at. Up at the top, you have a, a menu. Uh, you can save the, the what you've worked on, uh, including any changes that you might make to it. Uh, you can save it to your local computer with just save. You can save it on GitHub if you have an account there. Uh, you can save it on your Google Drive. Um, you can even create new notebooks and so forth. <clears throat> all right, uh, so what, what we first wanna do is we wanna clear all outputs. Okay, so if you've run this before and you, you get some, uh, some output from the previous times you ran it, that just clears it. And then under view, what we wanna do is click expand sections because a lot of times it will open up with some of the slides uh, hidden. You have to click on them to, to open things up. Uh, while we're running, you can always go up here to the runtime menu and you can uh, run the, the particular cells and you can also interrupt uh, so let's say you have a loop, which we're going to uh, show this in a little while. Uh, if you have a loop that keeps running, then you may need to interrupt it at some point. And you can restart uh, if, if something goes awry. <clears throat> All right. So uh, these, this Jupyter, particular Jupyter notebook was written by uh, Yang Lu, one of our former analysts. And I'll be going over that today. Uh, what we're going to be uh, discussing are these particular topics. We start off with constants and variables. We get into data types, control flow, uh, functions, and so forth. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have time to complete all of this, but uh, we're going to we're going to try and do as much as we can. Uh, about halfway through the class, I want to. Uh, have a, a short break. And uh, at any time, if you, if you have a question, uh, you can write it into the chat. And uh, we have uh, other staff members who can help you out with that, or they can convey the, the, uh, the question to me, and I can work on that. All right, what we're going to be working on is Python 3. Uh, Python 2 has reached the end of life for as far as support. A lot of uh, code is still written in Python 2, but uh, Python 3 uh, is the only thing that's that's supported from going from, from now on, uh, the only thing that will be updated. Uh, so if you have legacy code in Python 2, you may have uh, problems with it uh, eventually. But you should be aware that a lot of things that, you know, if you read uh, someone's code, you have to make sure that, that it's written in Python 3 and not Python 2, because there are some differences that are going to make, uh, make the program only, only viable in one in Python 2 or Python 3, uh, depending on specific uh, syntax. All right, uh, so constants and variables. Anytime that we're working with information, uh, we need to refer to uh, the, the information in, in certain ways. A constant is something that you put into your program that allows you to, you know, to uh, express a certain value or a string or, or something like that, uh, that is not gonna change throughout the lifetime of the program. A variable, of course, is uh, going to change as you, as you wish. Okay, so the number five is a, a constant. So if you have the number five in your code, uh, that number five is stored somewhere in the computer memory. So anytime that you need to print or do arithmetic or make an assignment, uh, the computer has to refer to that location in memory to, to find it. Uh, to illustrate uh, what we're working with, there's two functions that we're going to look at uh, in this example. One is called get size of, and this is in the sys, sys module, SYS module. 
And this just tells you how, how many bytes that a particular uh, value or variable has. Uh, ID gives you the identity or the uh, memory address, and it's not in Cython, it's in Python. I missed that. Um, all right, so the first thing is since git size of is in the sys module, the first thing that you have to do in Python, you have to import that particular module, that mod, that library. Uh, so once you import that, then that particular function is made available. And then we have several print statements. And the first print statement, what we're looking at is just the number of bytes that are in the, uh, the constant five. So we just put as a, an argument to this, uh, this function, we have the number five, we get the size of it, and since it is in the sys module, we have to prepend the the name the uh, the parent name, and then uh, this is formatted and put in this spot in the print statement. So what the print statement does is you start off with the string, and inside the string you're going to have uh, particular spots where it's going to replace the the formatting characters with uh, values which are pass on in the format argument. Uh, the col colon D is short for decibel integer. Colon S is short for uh, a string. So the first thing that we do is we get the size of that uh, specific constant. We format it uh, and pass it as a decimal number. The next thing we do is we're going to get the location of the of that place in memory, and what we're going to do is we're going to express this as a hexadecimal number, which is the hex function, and hex will convert it from a number into a string, and that is passed uh, at this location in the argument, uh, and then we can compare that between the number five and the number one two three four five six seven eight nine zero. Okay, they're both uh, integers. And let's see um, what we're what, what we're looking at as far as the uh, location. So let's go ahead and run. Now the first thing that you're going to do this notebook was not authored by Google, so that's just a warning to keep you from uh, running somebody else's uh, code uh, if you're if you're not sure. Uh, this one has was authored by us, so go ahead and run it. And so if you see in this upper left corner of this cell, this is a code cell. And in the code cell, if you, if you hit the run cell, th then that will execute all of the statements inside of this. And then the output will be added to the bottom. Uh, if, you're, if you're running something that takes a long time, while it's running, you may see a stop symbol up here and you can hit that to interrupt execution. All right, so what we get from this is that the number of bytes to store uh, the number five is 28. So that's quite a lot for such a small number. Uh, we get the specific address in memory, and this is formatted as a string. Um, so there's, both of these are the the addresses of the the two locations in memory are being expressed in a hexadecimal form, but this is one way to do it where you explicitly say, okay, I want 18 digits of a hexadecimal number, and I put the zero at the beginning to say pad the beginning with zeros. Okay, so I get 18 complete digits uh, that express where in the memory this is. All right, let me see. Okay. Um, so as you can see, the, the size and memory of the two constants is different. Because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero is such a large number, it goes beyond the, the basic integer. And so you need a little bit more room to store all of the, the data for that particular constant. And as you can also see, both 
the the memory addresses for both constants is going to be different. They're they're different values. They're going to be different places in memory. <clears throat> All right. So what you, you you might be wondering why does it take 28 bytes to store the constant five? It's such a small number that you could express that in in one byte. Um, so what happens is there's a lot of overhead that the uh, the Python interpreter uses to keep track of the the name of the variable and and uh, when it's used and so forth. All right, now inside of the formatting string, you have the curly braces. Uh, you can have nothing inside them and then it will just go to the default. Uh, whatever is passed, it will try to do the best it can, which I believe the, the default is a string. Uh, if you explicitly wanna say, okay, this is a, a decimal number, a decimal integer, you put the colon D. The colon S, if you explicitly wanna say that it's a string, and so forth. All right, so let's just look at uh, th this example here. I have two values and they're both gonna be stored in the variable A. First of all, we assign the number five and then we print that out. And then we store a string, hello world, and that's stored in the same variable. So it overwrites the five that was there before. And then we print this out as a string. But the problem is, down here, we have a print statement where we're trying to print this as a decimal integer, and it's not a number. So let's see what happens. If I try to run it, oh, it does the first two prints, and then when it gets to the third print, it gives me this big uh, convoluted error message. And it's very useful to try to, to uh, read through to uh, understand uh, what the error message is. Once you get used to what the what to expect, uh, you can start identifying. Okay, this error message just mean means oh, I need to change the uh, the formatting uh, character here. Um, all right, so it highlights the particular line that you're working with, and then it says unknown format code D for object of type string. So this is telling you that the value of the the, the variable is a string and you're trying to print it as a decimal number. So let's try this. Let's add in B equals 12. And down here, we replace A with B. And then we hit run, and that runs just fine. All right, so what you can think about when you, when you refer to a particular variable uh, is it's a location in memory. It's, it has a name. You refer to it throughout the program and uh, when you do assignments and you do print statements, call it with a function, do arithmetic with it and so forth. Um, and there's rules for the name that, that you can give to it. Uh, but once you have a name, then it's, if, as long as it's valid, then Perl or, uh, I'm sorry, Python will assign to it a particular memory location uh, where it's going to store the, the value of the object. Um, so when you uh, look up in the, the internal memory, the variable X is going to have a place in memory where it's referring to the, the particular value. So that information is gonna include the, what type of variable it is. Uh, if it's a string, it will uh, let you know how long it is and, and so forth. Um, and so once you have a place in memory where you have a value, then you have to, you're going to store information in there. So the information can be a number, a string, it can be a pointer to some object uh, and so forth. So uh, if I have a variable called balance, uh, let's say I'm keeping track of a, uh, a bank balance. Um, the balance would be the location in memory where the information is kept. So when, when I look up in uh, the memory, 
at that particular location, it's going to have a floating point number, and that's going to indicate how many dollars are in a particular uh, account. So as you spend, that number goes down. As you as you uh, generate income, that number goes up. Okay. Now the rules for naming a variable are like they are in most languages. They have to start with a letter or an underscore. Uh, it is case sensitive, so uppercase and lowercase letters uh, refer to different variables. So if I have uh, these names here, all of these names are valid variable names. They, they start with a letter or with an underscore. Um, you cannot start a variable name with a number or with a symbol. So if you're used to, sh to shell programming, Perl, or uh, other languages, uh, you may occasionally slip in a, a dollar sign and you will get a, a syntax error for that. Uh, another thing that is after the first letter, uh, you can have any combinations of letters, numbers, or underscores, but not a dash sign. So student underscore two is fine, but average minus GPA is not. That gives you an error. And like I said, the, the names of the variables are case, case sensitive. So boy and capital B boy and lowercase b boy, those refer to different variables. And there are certain keywords uh, of the language, such as and. And is a keyword which is used uh, uh, for logical uh, evaluation. You cannot use that as a variable name. All right, so if I have a statement where I have one variable equals another variable, what that does is that assigns the reference of y to x. So they both point to the same object. Um, now let's illustrate a few things here. In this first cell, we're gonna have two separate variables, one with the lowercase a, one with an uppercase a. If I run this, and it prints it out, it's gonna show you that it doesn't matter that they are the same word in the English language. Uh, what matters is they are different as far as the first character. The first character is one of one is lowercase, the other is uppercase. That makes a big difference. So you need to be very careful in your code uh, with uh, your punctuation or, or your capitalization. It's always good to have a system uh, where you you always uh, use capital in a in a a specific pattern, um, and that way when you're writing your code, you don't have to think, oh, did I did I express as as uppercase or lowercase, and so forth. All right, um, and so here, if they're both si assigned to the same value, then let's see what happens. Okay, they are both assigned the, the, the value 20. And so they both have the same uh, memory location. Uh, but once I change the value of one of them to, to 40, from 20 to 40, now they have different values. So they're gonna be pointing to different places in memory. Okay, so a lot of times Python in order to uh, be efficient with memory usage, if you're using the same constant in two, two different places, then it will give you two different, uh, or one single uh, constant value in memory, one memory location. And so both variables are gonna point to that same location in memory. Since it's a constant that, that location can't be changed, I can change the variable. And in that case, the variable's uh, address then changes. It's it's different than in uh, the C or C++ language uh, where a particular variable always has the same place in memory. All right, so let's look at some examples. What happens if you accidentally, you know, you forget or you don't realize that a particular word is a, a keyword. So if I use a reserved word 
and I try to make an assignment to it and I run it, then it's going to say, oh, this is invalid syntax. Well, that's not a, a lot of information to go on, but as long as you understand that uh, reserved words in Python uh, cannot be used as variables, that can give you uh, a hint. Um, even though the, the error message here doesn't really, uh, doesn't go into great detail. So here, this, this would be something useful if I click on search stack overflow. Uh, and it doesn't give you, yeah, that doesn't give you any information. But a lot of times uh, you can cut and paste the error message and say, you know, go to Google, look to see who has encountered the same problem before. And uh, if that's the case, they can give you some insight. Um, that's not always, you know, that doesn't always work because a lot of times uh, people will have completely different issues. So a lot of times it takes a little trial and error um, to figure out where your, your problem came from. All right, uh, uh, one, way, one thing that you can do is if you don't know all of the keywords, I can call this, uh, or I can import this particular module called keyword, and I can just print the list of keywords. So I hit run, and then these are all of the words that are reserved in Python. So all of these words here. And so some of these you may not be familiar with, you may, may not may never use, um, but uh, as long as you understand that these are um, reserved words, you'll know not to use them as variable names. So what happens when I have an invalid character here? Um, if I run this, then I'm gonna get a syntax error and it says can't assign to operator. All right, uh, that's not completely obvious, uh, but what's happening here is on the left, what it's trying to do is it's going to look for a variable called average and it's gonna look for a variable called GPA and it's gonna to try to do a, a subtraction. So that on the left-hand side is an expression. It's not a place in memory where you can store things. So what, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to assign to an operator, in this case is the, the operation subtraction. All right, uh, now here's another example. If I use a, a dollar sign, I forget that I'm working in Python and I put a dollar sign in front of a variable name and I hit uh, run, all right, it'll say invalid syntax. That's not obvious if you, you know, uh, once you get a little familiar with the language, you're gonna get more comfortable uh, knowing that you do not use the dollar sign, but, uh, that type of error is not completely obvious. You just have to keep in mind what are the rules for um, how to uh, um, how to name a variable. Another problem is if you misspell the name of a variable and you start working with it, assuming that it was assigned above, uh, you can run into a problem where you're trying to print something or do uh, an operation and you're gonna get the, this error that says, undefined variable is not defined. All right, so to solve that, I have to say undefined variable equals none. All right, so as long as I give it a, if it, give it a value, then it's gonna be fine. All right. Um, all of the, the constants variables are gonna have different types. Uh, one of the things that we saw above is we tried to print out a, uh, a uh, string as an integer. And so that was a uh, typing error. Um, so that's, this is a frequent problem when you're uh, first running Python and you're learning uh, the types of the different expressions, the uh, different functions and so forth. So let's start working with uh, numbers. Uh, numbers can be an integer, a floating point number, or a Boolean. Boolean is just true or false. Okay, so here's three examples. I have the, num the number three, 
assigned to A, and that's just a simple integer. 5.5, that's a floating point number, that's assigned to B. And the value true is assigned to C. Now, if I try to print these out, I want to add these three together. Well, in uh, transitioning from Boolean to uh, what other, other, other type, either floating point or integer, what uh, Python will do is a value true is going to be one, the value false is going to be zero. So I'm going to have three plus 5.5, that's eight, plus true, which is one, that should be 9.5. And then I'm going to print out the value of, of C as a decimal number. I'm going to try to negate C, see if that operation works on it. And then finally, I want to print, explicitly print out the type. I call the function type, and then I express this as a string. And then that's going to be the final argument here. So when I run this, then I get the value that I expected. C is going to be equal to 1. So 3 plus 5.5 plus 1. And then if I express it as an integer, then it's going to be 1. If I negate it, I can change it from a positive 1 to a negative 1. But if I explicitly want to know what is the type of this variable, then I can call type on that variable name. <clears throat> All right, so if I have two integers, I can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So let's see what happens. Uh, we, we already know what's going to happen with addition, subtraction, multiplication. But at this point, what's going to happen when I divide 10 by 4? Because it's not evenly divisible. So let's go ahead and run it. And here I express it as a floating point number. OK, so I start with two integers. I can get a floating point number. So let's go ahead and change this f to a d. I'm curious to see what happens. Oh, it doesn't like that because it doesn't know how to handle it. Because it, what it does is it, since you're doing division, it automatically changes it. That expression gets interpreted as a floating point number. So what I can do. So I can explicitly say it, nope, I want to keep this an integer. All right, so that what it does is it rounds down in that case. All right, another thing to keep in mind is the rules of operator precedence. If I'm working with uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, with, it matters. Um, it, normally what, you know, the, the literal uh, way to interpret an expression is just to go left to right, do our addition first, and then division. But uh, Python follows the the PEMDAS, which is uh, you know parentheses, exponent, um, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction order. So it will always do multiplication and division before it does addition and subtraction. So in this case here. If I want to say one plus two divided by three, so what's good? What this does is it says one plus two thirds, and that's exactly the value that you get here. If on the other hand, I want to add the A and B first and then do the division, I need to use parentheses because those take higher precedence over anything. Now, when we're working with variables in Python or, or constants, uh, we need to be able to express them as uh, strings sometime. I can use double quotes, I can use single quotes, and I can use what are called triple quotes. Triple quotes are basically you have three quote symbols in a row, and then you can have multiple lines, and then you end that quote with the same. What, what, wherever you started it. All right, so here I'm just going to assign the value a to cluster to a variable, print that out. Next, I want to say, all right, I need to uh, express two separate lines of information 
And so what I can do in my string, I can put a backslash in, and that will be replaced with the new line character. Um, and then I can print that out. And then finally, if I need to have multiple lines, it's sometimes easier rather than trying to put a bunch of uh, backslash ends or you know concatenating things together. I can just start the string, explicitly put what I'm going to have in here, and then end the string like that. So let's see. All right. So the first one, we just printed it out as is. Uh, string in two lines. You have the new line here that was uh, replaced. And then the triple quote. Notice that it has a space or a, a, a blank line, then the two lines that I put, and then another blank line. One thing that you can do if you do not want that opening. Uh, new line is to put a backslash after the, the triple quote. And then you can also put a backslash before on the line before the triple quote. The backslash must be the very last character of the line. So you can't have backslash quote or backslash space because uh, that will mess it up. So let's go ahead and just put it like that. Then when we run it, we, we see there's no extra lines there. All right. So if you're going to print out a string, and you, the formatting character for that is the uh, S character. So inside the curly braces, you just have colon S. And that says that this argument that I'm passing here is supposed to be a string. All right, so this is going to be the first exercise of the class. What I want you to do is uh, if you click on this, you should be able to, to edit it. And what I want you to do is just write some statements to assign to a variable called company the value Tom said it is Sam's Club. And I want you to print that out. Uh, and you need to explicitly have the double quotes inside of it and see what you can come up with. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. Okay, um, you can continue to work if you're if you're still working on it. Uh, what you do is is you just type it in here and then you hit the, the play. Uh, below is a, one of the solutions to this, or there's a number of different solutions. Uh, the first way that we can express the string with the quotes in it is we can use single quotes on the outside, so that on the inside we have. Uh, double quotes, those are interpreted fine and we don't have to do anything special for those. But since you do have the apostrophe in SAMS, uh, what you need to do is to use a backslash uh, single quote in order to express that inside of a, a single quote string. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just to simply use the triple quote format where you have three quotes in a row and inside there you have the uh, the statement, and then here you don't have to use any special backslash or anything like that. All right. Uh, if you're wanting to do it with a uh, the double quotes, here is another way to do it, where you have double quotes on the outside, and then when you need the explicit double quotes on the inside of the string, you use backslash in front of each of them. And then the, the single quote for the apostrophe, uh, you don't have to do anything uh, special with that. All right, so let me go ahead and run this. So each of these are our solutions to the above uh, problem. They all give you the same result. <clears throat> Now, if I'm working with an input file, I'm going to be inputting uh, strings. Or if I'm typing something in, then what it's going to do is the first thing, when I type something in as input on, on a program, what I've typed in or what I've input from a file is going to be stored as a string to begin with. 
So if you have some numbers in a you know that you've read in, uh, however you get them, and they're all expressed as strings, well, you're going to need to convert between string and the the integer type or the, the the floating point type. All right. So here we're working with a, a program where we already have a number, which is stored in the variable score. And then we get the value nine five as a string and that's stored in the value grade. All right, so what we want to do is we want to add these two numbers together. So as this first print statement shows you, one thing that you can do is you can convert the string into an integer by putting int around it. And then you can do your addition and this this, since both of them are integers, the, the sum will be expressed as an integer as well. Another thing that I could do, if I'm not sure how this works, I can start with the string, uh, convert the number from uh, the, the integer to a string, and then I just add the two strings together. See what we come up with that. So let's run this statement. Oh. Okay, it doesn't like the last one because if you're just trying to add those two, two values together, it doesn't like it because they're two different types. All right, so it says unsupported operand types for addition, integer on the left and string on the right. So it can't do those together. But the first two statements, those completed successfully with no error. Uh, the first statement, I add 82 to 95, I get 177, that's what we expect. The second statement where I add the two strings together, I get 8,295 and that is not uh, proper arithmetic, but it is uh, correct if I'm wanting to join two strings together. So I have the string eight, two, and then I add that with the string nine, five. So if you're using the, uh, the addition operation, you can add two integers together and it will do it numerically. If you have the addition uh, operation that you want to work with two strings, then what it's going to do is glue those two together, concatenate them. And as you can see with the error message, you cannot mix the types. Now, a lot of times what we're, when we're working with uh, various information, we're going to have a list or an array of uh, several pieces of information together. Uh, in Python, the way that we express a simple list is with the square brackets. And so you, you can create a variable, which is gonna be a list type. And in between the square brackets, you have uh, multiple values and uh, they're separated by commas. Now, you, this particular example, I have strings. I could mix this with strings and numbers or just numbers or all floating point. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as um, when I go to use the particular uh, place, I address what particular type it is. All right, so the first thing we do is we're gonna assign three strings to this list. I have biology, civil engineering, math. I print that out. Now. If I want to change one of the values, I can just refer to it by the, the index. Python starts with zero. So the zero, the, the zero index value is gonna be this one. So bi biology is overwritten with English. All right. And uh, then I can print that out. Um, the next thing that I'm, going to do is I'm going to make a test which is going to use the n operation which the list operation basically what you say is you say is this value in this list and what Python will do is it will search through the list until it finds a match and if it doesn't find a match then the, it returns false so the first time it finds a match it will return back true and then finally uh, what I can do is I can add to an existing list. I can grow the list in place. I don't have to do any sort of uh, 
you know, I don't have to worry about the memory allocation like you would in uh, C or C++. Uh, I don't have to make make room for the uh, the additional uh, values. Python uh, automatically takes care of that. All right, so finally, let's run this. So we start off with the the original three list, and then we change it, and then the new list is going to have biology gone and English in its place. And so if I do te a test that says is biology in department, then that becomes false. All right, uh, and then finally, when I add the this other this this uh, literal list here, I can add this, and it just glues it onto the end. So it takes the existing three values that were there to begin with, and then it adds whatever is in the new list. All right, um, so if I have uh, two values, or two variables, and I assign them the same value, uh, sometimes they, they get uh, assigned the same memory location, um, and then sometimes they're different. So we're gonna look at what the IDs for the, the two variables here, and then we're gonna test to see, is A equal to B? The comparison operator and Python is the double equal sign. Um, you have to be careful because a single equal sign, it will actually change the value of the left, uh, the left variable. All right, and then finally, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, we're gonna compare if A divided by 80 is equal to B which I'm gonna bet that it's not. So we go ahead and run. You see that when we first start off, it has assigned these variables two different memory locations. So we can say, all right, the, the numbers are the same. So the double equal sign will test the value, it will compare the values, even if the variables are at different locations in memory. And then if we do some sort of operation on the left, and we keep the original on the right, obviously they're not gonna be the same. Okay, so here's the next exercise. What I want you to do is create a list with two elements. It's gonna be two numbers. What The first number is gonna be expressed as an integer. The second one is gonna be a string, which is 257. And then I want you to do a uh, print the result of comparing the two elements together. And then I want you to print the sum of the two elements as integers. And then I want you to add another integer to that list and then print out that list. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. Okay, so let's go over the solution here. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a variable and we're going to assign it to the list. So we start off with the number, comma, and then a string. So we have two separate values, uh, the same number, but expressed one as an integer, one as a string. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare the first two, mixed list zero, to mixed list uh, sub one. That's just gonna pair, compare the index zero with index one. And then finally, I want to add those two together. And so I have to remember that the the uh, index, uh, index one is going to be uh, a string and I need to convert that to an integer to do the addition. And then finally, I just need to add the number 100 to the end of the list. And then we do that by just expressing the uh, array variable plus, and then we give it another, uh, another short list. So when I run this, then it's gonna compare those two. 
since one is an integer, one is a string, Python evaluates that as being not equal because they are different, uh, they have different information in memory. Um, but once I do the conversion, I can add them together as numbers. And finally, by, by uh, just using the addition, I can uh, append to that list. So let's start looking at uh, once you're running your program, you need to, to be able to ev evaluate, make tests. Um, you know, if this is true, then do this. And if it's not true, then do something else. So the, in Python, we have the if and else statements. So if you have a both an if and an else, then when the if statement is true, uh, then those statements that are bounded to the if are executed and anything under else is ignored. If the condition is false, then whatever uh, is bound to the if uh, statement, that is skipped. And if you have an else, which is optional, but if you do have the else, then those are executed. Uh, the way that Python will bind uh, statement blocks to a uh, control statement is by using indention. It's very tricky if you're used to other languages where you use curly braces or, or whatever, uh, then it takes a little bit getting used to, uh, to work with Python because it matters at the beginning of the line how many spaces you have. In other languages, it doesn't matter, but in Python, the way that they organize the uh, the statements to bind them to the control statements is through indention. So all of the statements in a uh, a statement block have to have the same number of spaces or tabs at the beginning. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to test a variable, have this this simple uh, evaluation to see if if this condition is true. If it's true then we're gonna use this statement here, print. If it's false, then we do the next one. Okay, obviously we already know what's gonna happen. It's a zero, uh, so that's very simple. Now I use the same statements, but I change the value of the variable, and instead of executing the first one, it's gonna execute the second one. So I go ahead and run this. And so this shows when it's true, it follows the first, code block here, x is zero. And when it's false, it follows the second code block. X is not zero. That's very, very uh, straightforward. Now, if I have more than one statement in a uh, code block, I need to make sure that they're lined up. So let's run this again. We're gonna compare uh, a number to see if it's zero, it's going to be false. So we're going to uh, drop down to here. We're going to do some operations and print that out. Then we're going to do the same statements under different conditions, and then it's going to it it will uh, it will execute the first one. And here, what we're doing is before we do a division between two numbers, uh, what we want to make sure is is this. Uh, yeah, this statement is should be x instead of the two. All right. Um, we want to make sure that as we're before we do a division, we want to make sure that we're not dividing by zero. So let's go ahead and run this here. We say x is not zero, so I can do the division. And then the second one, we say x is zero, so I cannot divide by that. And so instead of doing the, the execution, uh, then uh, we're going to actually just say, nope, I can't do that. So let's see what happens. All right, here, let's just change that statement. So we, we get the wrong result and we're gonna drop down here and we're gonna actually try to do division. So if I try to divide by zero, then I get this, this error message here, division by zero. All right, so we go back up here, I fix it, run it again. 
and that's why we're testing. We you test ahead of time. All right. Uh, if you're working with uh, information, a lot of times you need the user to type in uh, some information. Uh, in Python, there's a, a simple function called input, and you have as an argument for input, you give it a string, which is the prompt. And so that prompt is printed to the screen and the, the interpreter is gonna wait for the user to type in uh, an answer. So as soon as I type uh, an answer, then it's going to store it into the variable X. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna print it out. Uh, we're gonna say, um, we're gonna, we're gonna assume that it's an integer, but we're gonna print it as a string. And then we're gonna do some uh, arithmetic operations on it. Okay, so let's start off with this. So let's run it. So let's enter a number. All right, and so what this is gonna say is X, since I typed in, the, the, the program does not know ahead of time that it's expecting an integer. I have it, so whatever you type in is going to be stored as a string. So what happens is um, it's going to just print it as is, as a string. Uh, if I want to use it as an integer, I have to convert whatever I input using the the int function. Um, so in the first case, I'd say two times X. Well, X is a string. So two times a string, what that's gonna do is it's just gonna uh, replicate that string two times. So instead of uh, saying four, two times four, it's actually gonna be four expressed twice. So I get 44. So you always have to bear in mind uh, when you're inputting what the type of your input is, and you have to, to do conversions uh, as necessary. All right, so let's go ahead and combine those two uh, concepts together. We're going to input two numbers, and they, we're gonna assign those numbers whatever the user types in. And then we're going, to, we're going to compare them as integers. So that's a key. They're, when you type them in, they're going to be stored as a string to begin with. And what I want you to do is to determine which one's larger, which one's smaller. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing that we do in order to get the values is we're just going to uh, call the input function. And instead of storing it as a string and then converting that, uh, one way that you can do it is to just take uh, the, the result from input and immediately cast it as an integer. So what that does is it, it doesn't uh, take any intermediate step, it just, uh, gives you uh, an integer uh, that the type user types in. Uh, you have two of them, and you're gonna compare X and Y. Now there's two different ways to handle this. One way is you say, is X greater than Y? And if it's not, then, uh, then it's the opposite case. Well, what if they're the same? One of the features of Python is you can have multiple uh, if and else if. So you start off with one condition. You say you're comparing the two variables. And I say, is X greater than Y? Well, if that's false, then I drop down to the, the next clause. Uh, and here, instead of having an else, I have L if. E, and it just, that's just combining else and if together. So when the first clause is false, it drops down to here. And then I make another test. Well, if X is not greater than Y, then is X less than Y, okay? So then in that case, I, uh, I print them in a different order. But if neither of these are true, then the only possible explanation is that they are the same. So 
uh, that was not uh, part of the the original uh, problem, but that's just an illustration of another feature of Python. So I start off four, five. Okay, here it uh, it e either result is going to give you the the prop the correct answer, but here if I say four and four, well, in this case, the if you're just comparing it once, you're going to say one's maximum, one's minimum, even though the, even though they're the same. So uh, that's not as accurate. Uh, when I do the the else if, then uh, I'm able to detect the the condition where they're the same, and so I'm able to to handle that a little bit better. Um, Besides doing the if statement, uh, one of the basics is to be able to do a loop. So you have some initial condition, and then you're just going to repeat the body of the loop uh, as long as a certain condition is true. And as soon as that condition is false, then it goes, it drops out of the loop and it goes to the, the following statements. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to start with the number zero. And as long as the variable is less than four, I'm going to do a print statement. I'm going to print the value and its square. I'm going to, and then I'm going to increment uh, that value by one. X is equal to X plus one. And then finally, I'm going to print out the value as after it's been incremented. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. So let's run this. So I start off with the, the value zero, zero and its square zero. After I increment it, it goes to one. I do the test, it's still less than four. I go to the next one, okay? Uh, one and its squares, one and one, and then two and four, three and nine. Finally, uh, after the value of three, I increment it one and X becomes four. And then this is no longer true. So the loop, uh, finishes, and there's no other executable statements beyond that. We just have the comments. All right. Now here, one thing that you can do is if you're asking the user to type some input, you can do a check on it to see, okay, does this match the whatever condition that I want? Here, I'm, I'm asking the user to type in a password. Um, and then I'm going to compare that to a, a known password. So I run this. And the first thing I do is I say, hello. Enter. Nope, I didn't like it. All right, so it's asking me to enter the password again. So this will continue uh, forever until you say secret. Now notice up here, there's a, uh, a stop symbol. So if I want to, I can hit stop. All right. Now it does say uh, for runtime that you can interrupt by saying Control M I. But uh, on my laptop, if when I hit that combination, uh, it changes the windows. So uh, that may not work for you. But it always works to go to the menu up here or to hit the the stop symbol there. All right, so let's start off. We, we're gonna initialize uh, the variable X. We're gonna create a list, a list which is going to contain uh, the values from zero to four. So range of a particular value, that's gonna give you all the numbers from zero up to the number right before your argument. So range of five is zero, one, two, three, four, and so forth. Uh, then I create a list from that. And then what I wanna do is I wanna make that list double. So I'm gonna have zero through four, zero through four again. All right, now I initialize some variables, i and y. And I want to say, okay, how long is my list? As long as the, the index variable i is less than the length of the list, then I'm gonna keep going through 
uh, this this loop body. Now notice here, I have a while statement, and I have indentions after it. And all, so all of these are the body of the while loop, except for here, I have more indention, and that is after the if statement. Uh, one of the things I did forget to mention is after an if or a while or an else or else if, at the end of the line before you start a code block, you have to have a colon as the last character. So the colon says, all right, following this statement, there's going to be a code block. I'm going to have to indent. And so you treat that as a unit. So as long as my index variable is less than the size of the variable of the, the list, uh, it's going to keep going through this. It's going to print out the index and then the value at that index. And then it's going to compare. It's I'm searching for the value uh, which is stored in Y. Uh, and in that case, if I make a positive match, then I'm going to print out, okay, my uh, at location, uh, this index, I found the variable uh, of that, that, that particular value I'm looking for. And then since I found it, I don't need to keep searching. So I'm going to go ahead and quit this loop. So break statement, what that will do is whatever the uh, innermost loop that you're running in, it's going to go ahead and quit that loop. It's just, it's going to quit doing it. It won't do any more increments. It won't do any more tests. It just quits it. And that's it. So let's go ahead and run this. So I have, I start off with the lists zero through four, zero through four. I'm searching for the number four. So the length of my list is 10. So my index i is going to go from 0 to 9. So I start off 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Ah, I hit it right here. So x of 4 is equal to 4. It does not continue. So if I want to, I can comment out this break. So in that case, I'm going through the list. I find the, the value, print it out, and then I continue the loop at this point. Uh, without taking a break. And so I'm going to, if I have more than one instance of the value, which is here and here, both of them should be printed out. So if I do that, all right, so x of four is equal to four and x of nine is equal to four. Okay, so depending upon how you want your uh, program to evaluate a list or some other uh, operation, you may want to put a break in there and, and just stop at whatever point, but it gives you some flexibility for that. So the next step, what I want you to do is I want you to, like we did up here, where we ask the user to enter a password, I want you to, to keep asking for the password until the, the user correct, correctly enters it, uh, but only give them three guesses. After three guesses, we need to quit. Okay, um, so let's go over this and then we're gonna take a break after we've uh, gone over the solution for this. So as before, we know what our password is gonna be and we know how many tries. So we just have a variable that's gonna keep track of the number of times that uh, we have tried. And so as long as we haven't reached our maximum, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep asking for the password. If it's the correct one, then we quit. And if we get to the end of the while loop, we also quit. Um, 
this one, what you might want to do is you can say success equals false. And if it's correct, you can say success equals true. And then at the end, you can say if success print you guessed it. So let's go ahead and run it. And I did not get the, the password. Let's run it again. And we type secret. You guessed it. OK. So I keep track of uh, whether or not, I assume that the user does not know the password. And then once they do correctly guess it, then I keep track of it. And by doing the break, then I don't have to keep entering it over and over and over after I've already guessed it. So let's take a break. Uh, it's 11.15. Uh, we'll resume at uh, 11.20. Okay, um, the next type of loop that we are going to cover is the for loop. This is uh, not like the for loop in uh, C or C++, Python or Perl, or not, I'm sorry, uh, C, C++, Java, Perl. Uh, they all have a, a structured uh, for loop. In Python, the loop, uh, the for loop is going to just say, uh, you're going to have a loop variable, and then you say as long as this is in, and then you give it a list. Okay, your list can be a, a variable that contains a list, uh, or it can be the result of a, a function call, for example, the the range, um, or it can be an explicit list uh, that you you put inside braces. So the, the first thing that I do is I initialize X. I have the same list that I had before. And then uh, what I'm going to do is just print that list. And then I'm going to be uh, looking for the value Y. Uh, so the first thing I do is I just print out the list. And then what I, and what this does is the variable Z is going to go over all of the values in the list x. But what if I need to know what is the index of the location where I find uh, the value 3? So I, I can just say, is y in x? And that will either be true or false if the, if the value 3 is inside this list. Uh, but what if I want to know what is the location? In that case, I can't just keep track of the values. I have to know the location. So if I just iterate through the numbers that are the, uh, the indices of the list, so in this case, the list x is going to have a certain length. It will be length 10. And then I need to go have a range. So range, is as, as we talked about before, that function gives you all the numbers from 0 up to 1 before. Uh, the argument. So in this case, the argument is 10. So I get the numbers 0 through 9. So and uh, those are the indices of the uh, array or the list x. So then what I do is I compare at that location i at that index uh, for the search value. If they're the same, then what I want to do is I want to print out or I uh, say, OK, I found it. It's at this location i, and it's equal to the search value y. And then I quit. Um, another thing that you can do, I can iterate through the values, through the indices. 
or I can also iterate as a pair where I say, all right, give me the index and the value for every item in the list. And that is accomplished with the function called enumerate. Enumerate, it will give you back the index, the value, and it will go to the next one, the next one, and so forth. So that way I already have preloaded. I don't have to uh, look it up like I do here. Um, I simply say I and N. Okay, I test to see if the value is what I'm searching for. If it is, then I print out I and the value. And that's all. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay, we have our list. Um, oh, that's curious. I'm not sure why this, okay. So this just prints out what uh, the, the, the call to uh, list provides you. The second one, we actually take that result and we, we double it. So the value of the, the variable X is gonna be this list doubled as we did before. And then we're gonna go through and we're just gonna print out the values in the list. So one by one, each line is uh, one statement in the loop, the first for loop. The next thing that we do is we just go through and we search. And when we find a result, we print this out. So that's the, the next for loop is x of three is equal to three. So the first time it encountered the search value is at index three. All right, and the final one is when we're using the enumerate, we get the same result as we did with this one, but it's a little bit cleaner because I get the, the values in, in one single variable. I don't have to do uh, indices or anything like that. Now, a lot of times when you write some code, you don't wanna keep repeating the same thing over and over and you know, you copying and pasting the, the, the same lines of text into different parts of your program. So I can just write a function. I call the function, I give it specific arguments, and then uh, it's gonna give you a result. We've already seen a number of the functions uh, that are uh, built into Python. Um, so let's, if you look, uh, this is a very good website, docs.python.org. And this particular link here, we open this up. This is gonna give you a list of all the different uh, built-in functions. So we've already seen int and id and hex and, and a number of these others. So these, this list here are the, uh, the functions that are built into the Python language. They're, they're already defined. You don't have to import them from a module or anything like that. So it's, it would be very helpful for you to go through these lists, uh, click on a specific one, uh, let's say float, and this will give you a, a description of, you know, what you're allowed to pass to it, what you're going to get from it. And, you know, in uh, certain cases, uh, if you have um, not a number infinity, you know, what's that going to look like and so forth. Um, all right. So let's look at the function sorted. Okay, so if I have a list, uh, and in this case, what the, the manual calls it is an iterable. So a list is one type of iterable. So any type of object that you pass to it, which allows it to go through uh, iteration in a particular order. Um, and also there's some, uh, some other arguments and we won't get into that, um, what all of this means. But one of the things is we can specify a key to say, okay, I'm not just going to, I don't want you to just sort them in the most obvious way. I want you to sort them based upon a particular key. Um, another thing that you can do is I wanna sort it in reverse. Okay. 
So I start with this list of integers, positive and negative integers, and I want to sort them together. And so what I do is I print out, I just pass this list explicitly into the sorted function. It prints out what the result is. There's also a ABS function that returns the absolute value, just takes off the uh, minus sign. I can convert from a floating point to an integer. And so it's gonna remove the, uh, the fractional part. And uh, I can also pass a list of numbers and I can just add them together by calling sum. So let's go ahead and run this. As you can see, what this does is it's, it sorts them in numerical order. So negative four is the, the smallest, positive three is the largest. I take a, a number which has a minus sign in it and I call absolute value function and I just get the same number but without the sign. Um, if I have a number, a floating point number, and I just want the integer part of it, then uh, I call int. And what this will do, um, if it's a positive number, it usually rounds down. If it's a negative number though, it will round up. So all it's, it's just being very basic. It takes away whatever comes after the decimal point. It, it doesn't do any sort of uh, any, any other more intricate uh, rounding. And of course, if I wanna add a list of numbers together, I just call sum and it gives me one result. In addition to the built-in functions and the functions that you can Im import from modules, you can define your own function. So let's go ahead and look at the, the function factorial Factorial of n is just one times two times three all the way up to n, and that gives you a result. Um, this is a very naive uh, implementation of the function, but that's okay. We're just doing this for illustration purposes. Uh, we start off with the number one, and that's gonna be our product. And then what we wanted to do is to say, I wanna go from one up to n. So n, so in that case, what we have to, for the arguments for range are, um, let's go over here to range. Yeah, so if, if I just have one number in range, as we saw before, it goes from zero up to one minus that number. But if I have two numbers, then I have a starting number and then the stop, but it doesn't stop at that number, it stops one before that number. So what this does is it starts at one and then it goes up as long as the, the value of i is less than n plus one. So the last value of i is gonna be the number n. So each time through, I multiply i times uh, the number, uh, times the existing product. So my initial product is one. I multiply one by one, one by two, by three, by four, and so forth. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is every step of the way, I'm gonna print out at that iteration, what is the, the current running product? And then finally, when I'm done, the final uh, value of product, I return that. So when I call, a, when I create a function, it's just the DEF is the keyword. So I, I specify DEF and the name of the function. It, it has the same rules as, as it does with variables. You can't have a keyword as a, a variable name or as a function name. You can't uh, put special symbols and so forth in it. And you have to have a colon at, at the end of that line. So what that says is everything following that colon that is indented uh, is going to be the, uh, the body of the function. And inside of the body, we have a for loop. And so that is also indented as well. As soon as we get back the, here to the original indention, that means the function is ended. And so here, this is outside of the function. I call the print function and inside of it, I call factorial. And I do that for two 
separate cases. So the first case, I get up to 120 for five factorial. And for the, the tenth case, I get up to uh, three million six hundred twenty-eight thousand eight hundred. All right. Okay, so what I want you to do in this next exercise is to write your own function and I want you to call it search. And you're going to pass it as the first argument, A is going to be an array or a list. And that's misspelled. Um, and then you need to search for the particular value X. And what it does is the first time it encounters the value X in the search, it's going to return the, as a return value. What we do here is return. Uh, it's going to return the index where it did find that that value. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm giving you the uh, the arguments in the incorrect order. Here, what we're going to start with is we're going to have, well, yeah, this is wrong. This should be a of i equals x. If Okay, so as soon as I find the value X within the, the array A, I return back that index I at that point. If I do not find the value in the list at all, then what I do is I just return a negative one. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes for that. Okay, um, and in this case, this solution, uh, you're supposed to return negative one and here they have the value none. So let me correct that. So by the instructions, if you do not uh, find the, the correct answer, then you're gonna return back negative one. So we assume that we're not finding it. And then we just go through uh, every location in the array A. Okay, so in order to, to go through all of the indices in A, I need to first know how long is A, how many how many values are in there, and then I need to just go from uh, from zero to the last value, the last index in that variable. Um, here I'm printing out what is in the location what the what the index is and uh, and then if I make a determination that that location matches the the search value, 
uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return back that index i. So I don't need to do anything else. And if that fails, then I drop down to here. Once I've gone through all the items in the list, if I did not find it and this, this was not called, then what happens is it returns back the value negative one. Um, so inside of a function, you can have a, in the body of the function, you have a loop and then you have an if statement. Wherever you have the return statement, that finishes the execution of this function and it does nothing else inside of this, the, the, the body of the function. So the return statement is like a break where it gives back a value and it stops execution of the program, of the, uh, of the function. So given this search list, I'm gonna uh, ask the user to type in a number. I'm gonna search for that number. Okay, and here I have negative one. Um, the instructions say return negative one if it's not in the list. You could also, I had it, you know, the solution was also this was correct before I changed it. You could have uh, any number here or any value here that isn't a valid value for a uh, an array index. So it could be a number, it could be a string, whatever. But you first test to see uh, if it's equal to negative one. So going by the instructions, we return back negative one of, and we have to do a test. And so let's go ahead and run this. So let's look for the number three. We know it's not in there. It goes through all of the, the, uh, the indices. It's not in the list. All right, let's run it again. Give it the value uh, eight. All right, so it goes through the list and then as soon as it finds the value and it says uh, the index of the value eight is three in the list. All right, um, so a lot of times you're gonna write, you, you can, if you're running uh, Python in a shell, Let's see. All right, so let me just show you an example. Um, if I'm logged into to the Terra cluster, uh, you can be on, on your, your own machine or, or another machine, but uh, by default, if I run Python, the default for this environment is 2.7. So that's an old version of Python. If I need to have a newer version of Python, what I need to do on our clusters is use the module command. And so uh, the first thing you can do is you can search using the, the spider or avail command uh, to say what, what versions of Python are available. The latest version that we have is Python version 3.8.2, and it's compiled under GCC core. All right, if you have, uh, if you have a loop and you, you, you're not able to, it continues running, uh, remember that up at the top left, of your code, if you're, if you're, uh, if that segment of the program is still running, you can always hit the the stop button, and that will stop it. Also, you can say go up here to your your menu and say runtime, interrupt execution, and that will stop it. So somebody had a, a question about that. Okay, so uh, what I do on the the clusters. If I need to run in, in Python version three, I need to load a module and that will take a minute. And that sets up the environment. So there's a particular version of Python. So when I type Python, that's in my path. It's version 3.8.2. Okay. 
So, um, all right. So coming back here, if I am, am just wanting to, to, to test out Python, uh, I can do this where I can go in here and I can uh, assign things to variables. like this and I can do operations on them. But as soon as I hit, you know, I type uh, exit or, or control D, um, then it's gonna quit. Everything that I did before is gone. I haven't saved anything. If I need to do something regularly, what I need to do is I need to put that into a script. Okay. Um, so, We'll get that into that in just a minute, but first of all, let's talk about modules. Modules are programs that have already been written by other people, uh, and there are quite a few different modules. Some of them are more standard, uh, and you can uh, you can always find more cutting edge modules people have written for specific tasks. Uh, let's say you're working on a certain you know new type of science and uh, Someone's written a module to to do a something that's that's suited to your uh, area of expertise, and they're able to you know do some calculations that uh, that you need to get done. Um, so, but in the general case, there's a number of of standard libraries that uh, are available in most uh, Python installations. So uh, one module for example would be the the module called random in this case uh, you import that module and then you're able to uh, call uh, functions within that module that allow you to uh, generate random numbers so in this case here what we're going to do we're going to go from uh, zero to nine and then each time through we're going to print out a random number between one and five and notice that the, the, the arguments, the A and B, the two arguments to randint, those are uh, available as uh, outputs. So I can have one, I can have five, or I can have anything in between. So let me run this. And so I run it 10 times, I get 10 different numbers. You run it again, you should keep getting uh, different numbers every time you run it. So the next thing that I want you to do is to write a, a simple program uh, that you're going to uh, generate a number between one and 10, and then you're gonna ask the user to input an answer and see if they guess the correct answer. And then you're just gonna keep, uh, and what you're gonna do is you're going to say, if they guess the wrong number, you're gonna tell if they're high or low. If, if their guess is, is above the correct answer or if it's below. And so let's go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll let you do that. And we'll come back here in just a minute. Okay, um, we're running a little short on time. So let me go ahead and go over the solution. Uh, if you're still working on it, you can 
keep working on it if you if you like. So the first thing that we do is we have to import random to be able to call that. And then uh, what we need to do is, uh, well, there are a number of different ways to do this. We don't necessarily have to write a function, but uh, um, in, this, in this case, it may be an easier uh, way to do that. What we're gonna say um, is we're gonna pass an argument to it which is going to be either uh, correct, right, that, that you guess the number, or we're going to pass low or high to it. And then what, what we do is we pass the evaluation as a, an argument to display message. And then we say if it's correct, and then it prints this out. And if it's not correct, then we say if it's, if it's too low or too high. And so basically you're doing these, these statements over and over and over. You might as well just put it into a, a, a simple little function that handles the operations for you. Uh, functions and modules are different. Function is, a, is one single uh, element of a program that, uh, that, that takes arguments and gives you back a value. A module can contain multiple functions within it. Uh, so it's it's a, a module is is a library. So a library can contain multiple different uh, functions that are specific to that that type of uh, you know. If you're working with random numbers, one of the the things that you you can call is the uh, uh, randint. Okay. Uh, you can also look for, you know, floating point numbers and so forth. What you'd have to do is you'd have to look at the the manual for the random module in in uh, Python, and that there I would go to the uh, you know uh, python.org website and search on the documentation. And so it, it's for every module, what they're going to do is they're going to give you a list of all of the different uh, defined functions for that module. And they're going to give you a synopsis of how do you use each of the different uh, functions. What are you know? What are the different cases? Uh, you may have a, a function where you have one argument or two arguments, and you know, uh, what do the two different arguments mean, and so forth. Um, so here, what we do, we generate a random number, and then as long as uh, we have the value true. So this, this while loop will go on forever until you get the correct answer, at which point it does a break. Okay. So um, in this particular implementation, what we're going to do is we're going to have the user input a number and we in, in immediately convert that to an integer. Uh, and in that case, we put store that into the variable guess. Then we compare the value guess to the, the correct answer. And if it's less than that, then it's too low. If it's greater than that, it's too it's too high. And if it is the correct answer, then we tell them that it's the correct answer, and then we quit. So in this case here, it's a very simple. Uh, I guess in the middle, five is too high, two is too high. Obviously, it's just one. All right. So we can keep going through that. That's uh, fairly simple. This next uh, here, this will give you some information on all of the different modules which are available. If I run this, it's going to give me a lot of warning messages about, uh, you know, the uh, some of them are no longer supported and, and things like that. So if you want to, uh, you can do that. But but just know it takes a long time for this to complete. So that does give you uh, some, some useful output. Now, if I've written uh, some useful uh, programming um, in Python, what I want to do is I want to save this to a file so I can come back to it tomorrow. I can, I can give it to a colleague uh, if they need to solve a problem. And uh, you, you can put it into some sort of production environment. 
basically in uh, Python, a simple Python script is just one single file that contains the, the Python statements. Everything that we've seen here in the, the uh, code cells of, uh, of this notebook, each of those are, are just fragments of code. I can put more complex things together and put them into a single file. And then if I want to use it over and over and over again, then it's, it's available. All right, so let's go here. All right. Um, so this, yeah, I have this these out of order. I'm sorry. So if you run this one, it's going to say it cannot find uh, the input file. So let's go ahead and generate an input file here. So skip down to this cell and run this. So what this does is it creates a, 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 a list of numbers uh, on separate lines. And then what it's going to do is it's just going to open up a file in write mode. And then it's going to output that string to it. And, and we'll get into uh, um, how you work with files. But uh, there are two different ways that you can work you know, two basic ways to work with a, a file. You can work with it as input where you're just reading from it. You can also uh, use it as an output file and you can write to it. Uh, you can open it in more complicated ways where you can read from it and then write to it and uh, seek back and forth into it, but we won't get into that into this, in this class. But in this case here, once I've executed this state, this cell here, if I go over here on the left, and look at the files. I've created this file here, integers.txt. If I double click on it, then it's gonna show me the content of that file. So it just has a list of four integers and that's all. Here, what I'm gonna do in this code segment is I open that file for reading and then I, cre I create a new file or overwrite an existing file uh, called integer sum. So when I open integers, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna add every item in that, that, file, that input file, store it into a, a variable called total. And then I'm going to print that out. And then I'm gonna output that to this, this new file, integersum.txt. So that file doesn't exist yet until I run it. And so what I've done is I've opened it up uh, one for input, one for output, and then I want to read from it. Uh, one way that I can do that is with the, the input file descriptor here, which is just the variable input file. I say for line in that file. So what that means is it's just gonna go through that file, each line by line and store the value into the variable called line. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert that the, the value that's stored in that variable into an integer, add that to my running total. Once I've finished with that, in order to write to the output file, I have the output file descriptor dot write, and then I give it the string, and I want to add a new line to the end of it. And then I have to close both the, the input file and the output file. And so if you're working with a lot of files, uh, doing a lot of file IO operations, make sure that you, uh, if you haven't opened, you also have a close. All right, so I run this. So it says the sum of the integers from the input file is 621. And I go over here and I have that answer, which is stored in the, this, uh, this new file here, integersum.txt. All right, and another thing that I can do is instead of having an open and a close, I can use the, the keyword with. So I can say with this, whatever the result of this open is. So I'm gonna open a file for writing and I'm gonna use the handle output file. So with this open as output file, 
So whatever uh, object is generated when I call the open function for writing, that's stored in this, this file handle variable here, output file. And then inside this, I have another loop that says with, and then I have a, a separate open for reading as an input file. So these are nested one within the other. As soon as I get outside of the with statement for an open file, that automatically closes the, the file. So I don't have to have the uh, open and close. I just use the with statement and that will allow me to, uh, to use that file for, for reading and writing. As soon as that, that loop body uh, completes, then, uh, then the file is closed automatically. So then what I do is I've opened the output file, I've opened the input file, and then I just use the same construction I did before for line in the input file. I add the values and then I just do the write and then I'm done. I don't have to have all of the, the close and, and separate, you know, it's, it's a lot neater, uh, more concise. So I run it, I get the same result. Okay, this one doesn't print it out like this one did. So it just prints it to the file. Uh, if I delete this, yeah, let me delete it. Delete file. And then I run it again. I should get it back. Okay, it's back. And it gives me the same result as before. All right. Um, much time okay um so if i have if i'm trying to open a file and i have the file either doesn't exist or i have some sort of permission uh problem then uh i'm gonna en encounter an error so this one here i'm gonna try to open a file non-existing.txt that's that's called foreshadowing and so once I open that input file, I'm gonna uh, print out the lines in the file and then that's it. And then say, I'm done. But when I try to run this, since the file doesn't exist, I get this error. And it says, okay, here I'm at this line, tried to open the file, file not found error. That's pretty pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, that, that tells you what the problem is helps you helps you to figure out uh, how you can fix that. All right. Now in Python, what we can do is is if we're going to do something that we think might generate an error, so it depends upon the user putting this file in place. If so, we don't know if the user did follow the instructions or not. So we're going to say, OK, let's go ahead and try doing this. If we encounter a problem, then we're going to handle it. So try is kind of like an if else. So you say try, you do some sort of uh, loop or statement body here. And if you get through all of this with no problem, it executes and then it goes on and it's done. Okay, but if it encounters a problem at this point, what we can do is we can handle it. So if I have an exception with, which is an OS error, Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, if I encounter an OS error, I'm gonna store that error code in the variable ERR. Okay, that error message. And then I'm gonna say, all right, I encountered an operating system error, and then I print out what that error is. So here I run it. So instead of having the whole program quit, you may wanna handle it within you know, within your program just to have a little bit more uh, more user-friendly uh, information. It will, it will just give you an indication, okay, what is the that error, all right? And this last one, since I have the, the print statement without knowing the result of what it is up here, this, this last print statement is a lie, but that's okay. Uh, this is just for illustration purposes. Okay, um, so what you want to do is you want to go through the uh, the list of uh, possible exceptions. Uh, 
uh, which is at this link here. If I click this, all right, um, this will, will give you a, an indication of uh, the different types of uh, uh, memory errors, key errors, import errors, end of file, uh, OS error. That's the one that we just looked at. And uh, there's a lot of different types of uh, exceptions that you can have in different situations. So if you're writing a program and, and you want to, um, uh, to be able to, to, to know what's going on in, in, in more tricky situations, try to learn uh, what exception would be uh, appropriate for that condition. All right. Um, another thing that we can do is when we're working with lists, the, the, a simple list is just index 0, 1, 2, 3. But what if we want to associate some more complex information, some key with a, uh, the values in, the, in your list? So a dictionary is an associative array. It's a mapping uh, which maps a key to some sort of value. So uh, what happens with the dictionary is I, I give it a key, which is instead of a, a, a number, a simple number, and that associates it with a particular location in, in our dictionary. If you write the two different values and use the same key, the second time it's going to overwrite the first one. So let's look at um, uh, a key can be, uh, here this is explaining, a key must be immutable. So it has to be a, a, a number, a string, uh, something like that. A list, which can, can grow in size and things like that, uh, that's not uh, allowed as a key. So it just has to be a, a, a simple scalar value, either uh, a number, string or something like that. All right. So the way that I create a list from scratch is instead of having it in the square braces, I use curly braces. And to to express it as key values, what I do is I have the key colon, the value, comma, and then the next pair and so forth. So in this case, I'm saying the 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 value associated with Tom is 35. The value associated with May is 28. I can, I can create the dictionary this way, or I can say, all right, I have this, this list of, uh, of pairs. Uh, these are called tuples. Um, which we haven't, we, we didn't cover that in this class, but basically it's just two values that are surrounded by parentheses. And so you can pass those independently together in a list and it will build a dictionary from a list, a list of tuples. All right, another thing that I can do is I can call the function dict, D-I-C-T, and then as arguments, I have the key equals the value, key equals the value. So that's another way to do it. And another thing that you can do uh, in, uh, at least in Python 3, I don't know how much of this uh, would be available in Python 2, but um, as you can say, you can have a, uh, a constructor it's called a, a list comprehension. So basically inside of the curly braces, I say X and then colon, and where I'm gonna map from this value X to this value here, which is a number plus its square divided by two. And that is gonna be, this formula is gonna be, a, this mapping formula is gonna be applied for all values of X in this list here. All right, so that's a little bit a little bit trickier. Um, each of these ways works. 
and you you come up with these these uh, dictionaries in every case. Uh, there's just multiple ways to 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 generate the the dictionary. All right. So if I want to work with the dictionary, there's a, a few things that you can do. Number one, you can look up what is the value for a given key. And that's just the, the name of the, the dictionary variable. And then in square braces, and then you give it the key. Uh, if the key does not exist in the dictionary, the, the key that you pass, it's going to generate an error. And there's a way to, to test for that. Uh, you can test to see if a key is uh, is a loud key in that dictionary by just using the in keyword. Okay, so first, before I, I try to extract a value from my dictionary for a given key, I test to see does that key exist in this dictionary. It's true if the key does exist, if, if I'm going to get something back. If it's false, then I know, oh, okay, I'm not going to try to extract that because it doesn't exist in there. I can handle that. Another thing that you can do is you can kind of combine those together and you can say, in this dictionary D, I'm gonna call git. And what git will do is it will look up D of K, but only if K is, an, is, is a key in D. If K is not a key in D, then the second argument is gonna be, what is my exceptional case? If this, if the key K does not exist in the dictionary D, instead return back the default, or whatever, whatever this argument is, the second argument. Oh, sorry. Another thing, if you're working with dictionaries, let's say you're doing some processing and you say, okay, I've handled this particular case. And so I don't need to work with that anymore. So I can just say, um, delete. So DEL, is a uh, command. Basically, it just says, get rid of whatever uh, is, is associated with the key K. And so then at, after that point, the value doesn't exist and also the key doesn't exist. All right, I can extract all of the items in the, the dictionary in a, in a list form by just saying, calling the, the dictionary.items and it returns back uh, the new list form. Or I can also iterate over all of the keys. All right, so uh, here's a case where I have a, a created dictionary. I have keys Tom and May. Then I'm gonna try to do some sort of operation by using the key Bill. Well, as we can see, that doesn't exist. So that's gonna that's gonna generate an error. That'll say, okay, I have a key error, key bill that does not exist in the dictionary. All right. So what I want to do is I want to first test: does that key exist in the dictionary? If so, I do my operation. I print the result. If not, I say, oh, it's not in the dictionary. That way, I don't have to. I don't let the program crash. I keep it running, but I handle it uh, by evaluating first. All right. Um, and there's more uh, in instructions on the best way to handle uh, the exceptions. Uh, if you follow this link here, this will give you uh, a lot more documentation on doing the try and accept. So instead of doing the test here, I can just say, oh, I'm going to try this. And if this does not generate a problem, then I'll execute it and I'll, I'll go on my way. If this generates a problem, is it a key error? If it is a key error, then what I can say is, all right, that, that key does not exist in the dictionary. Error key is not in dictionary. Okay, key, okay. So that what the value of ERR is, that will be the key that you're trying to look up that doesn't exist. All right. Now, the next step here, uh, go ahead and run this, and this is gonna generate a file. So when I run it, 
it takes all of this text and stores it into the file called declaration of independence.txt. So if I look over here, I just generated that. If I look at that, that has all of those lines in it. So what we're going to do here, all right, is we're going to open the file for input and we're just going to print it out. So if I do like this, all right, you can see that what I've done is when I when I say print here, each line, it has a new line that I read from it, plus the print statement adds another new line. So what it does is it does it does everything double spaced. So if you don't want to have that, okay, what you want to do is as you read a line from the file, you're going to strip the uh, the new line or any any uh, spaces, tabs, or new lines at the end of the line. So that's what R strip does. When I call R strip, uh, that's going to uh, take off that new line. So if I run this again, then I get the uh, the text, but without double spacing. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to look at the content of the the input file, and we want to look at the individual words within the the, the program. Okay, so what we can do to separate a line into individual um, individual words is we can just call the split function. the The split function is going to uh, take a string, and it's going to return back a list of uh, individual elements within that string, separated by whatever the the formatting. Uh, the, the, the separation character is. By default, it's a space. Uh, so when I call split, that's going to give me back the, uh, the uh, all of the words in that line separated and put into a an array. So let me run this. All right, so each line, I'm going to print out the line, and then I'm going to show, OK, I have all of these words in there, uh, which is nice. It, it, it does all of that automatically for me. Uh, but one thing that you'll notice is that instead of just having the word, I also have punctuation. Punctuation is not treated any special way. So bear that in mind. So now what we can do is I want to keep track of how many times um, a particular word is encountered in there. So what I do is for every word that I get, every word for, for every line, I'm going to look, does that, has that word been encountered before? If the word is in the, the frequency table, then I'm just going to add one to the value. If it's the first time, then I just initialize it to one. So then when I run this, I'm going to get a list of all the words and how many times uh, they were all encountered. OK, so. All right. Now, there's no sorting. Uh, or anything like that. So what we're going to do uh, in this next section is we want to open up that file. And what we want to do is to uh, to group them by how many letters are in each word. Now, don't worry about punctuation or anything like that. Just input the, the, the words as we do up here. And then what you need to do is to, um, what is the? Output an integer x followed by the, the words of that length. So you start off with length words of length one, like i and a, words of length two, and so forth. So actually, we don't have time uh, to do that exercise. So I'll just go over the solution. So what I do here as I read it in, and then for every word, I calculate the length of that word by calling the len function. 
And so that will give me the number of characters for that particular word. And then what I do is uh, I look up the, the length to see is that in the, uh, the table of words or the dictionary uh, for that particular length. If this is the first word that has a particular, uh, the, a particular length, then that initializes the list. If this, I've seen it before, then I'm just gonna append, I'm gonna add that word to the end of the list. Okay, and so all I do is, is I keep doing that. And then what I do is I'm gonna iterate through all of the, the lengths, uh, the, the keys in, the, the, uh, in this dictionary. And for every word length, I'm gonna print out the array that contains those words. All right, so words of length three are these, words of length nine and so forth. Now notice this is not sorted in any, in any order. So what I can do is if I want to sort things, we saw this previously, we call the sorted function and uh, we just pass it an array. It gives us back the, the same array in sorted order. Um, so in this case here, if I have a dictionary and I want to sort it, it's going to sort it in terms of the keys. All right. But what if I wanted to sort it in order of the values? Well, in that case, when I call sorted, um, I'm going to give it the, the actual values of the, of the dictionary. So items is just going to return back the values with, with no consideration for the keys. All right. All right, so this, uh, let's see, the first one, it sorts the numbers. The second one, it just sorts the values. So it has no, are the keys, I'm sorry. It, it has no consideration for the values. It just gives you the keys. It puts them in alphabetical order. Um, and then finally, if I'm gonna go through the items, what uh, all of the items is gonna give me back the key and value pair so it's gonna sort those in order. And it looks like it's sorting them according to the key. What if I wanna do something a little more tricky? In that case, when I call sorted, I can give it, I can specify the key. Okay, and in this case here, I wanna sort the key based upon the length of the key string. So these are three letter, three letter, seven letter, five letter, four letter, five letter. Okay, so let's print this out. So this is gonna sort them according to the, the length of the key. Which that doesn't seem right because it gives me Michael before Peter. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, okay, another thing what you can do is, is we can call what's called a lambda function that generates a, a small little function uh, in place that says for every item that you're going through, the, the key that we're going to work with is for this particular value, uh, the, the value x, which would be the key, I want to look at the, the value of the, uh, the dictionary. So for for the, the key Tom, X would be Tom, and X sub one would be 30. Okay, or oh, actually, I'm sorry, X would be Tom comma 30, and then X would be May comma 40, Michael comma 35. So this is gonna sort it by the value. So if I do this, then the, uh, the the beginning would be 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So it sorts it according to that. So now that we know how to do that, as we read from the, uh, the, the input text file, we calculate the, um, 
we, we look at the word. If it exists, we put it into the frequency table. We keep track of the frequency. And then what we want to do is we want to print out this these frequency tables, but we want to sort it on the number of um, the, 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 the size of the frequency. OK. So let's go ahead and run. All right. So here we have all the words that only only occur one time, and then more and more, and then finally words like of and the are over seventy times. All right. So the last, this next one here, uh, what we do is we're going to um, those word groups by their word length. Okay. A group of words whose length is shorter are displayed before any groups whose whose length is longer. So this is a solution for that. What we do is we get the length and we store them according to the length into a, an array. Uh, but we first test to see does that did we already encounter that word before? If we have not, we append it to the list. So we should not have duplicate words in the list. Before we did, uh, this time uh, we're just going to add it. All right. I'm sorry, that's not correct. Um, so it will append a word based upon uh, only if, if another word of the same length has already occurred. So yeah, it, it will have duplicates. So when we do that, OK, we're going to have the same word over and over and over. OK, and then we're going to have all the two letter words, three letter words, so forth. Makes a nice uh, diagram. All right, uh, a regular expression is uh, something in, in Unix. It's very useful to learn uh, regular expressions. Uh, Python has a module called RE, allows you to do regular expressions. Um, uh, the uh, regular expressions have a, a long history in Unix, uh, Perl uh, is well known for, for enhancing those regular expressions, adding some more features to it. So a lot of languages will borrow from uh, Perl to have the, the new special features of regular expressions. Um, I'm not going to go over uh, exactly how, uh, you know, all the different uh, possibilities for regular expressions, but it, it would be very much to your advantage if you're doing any sort of uh, string comparisons to put um, uh, to 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 become familiar with uh, working with regular expressions, learn how to use them, learn how to do search and match, and so forth. So the first thing that we do is we import the regular expression module, and then we have something that we're going to search. We're going to look for the string graduate, and just to see does it does it match? Okay, and if so, then that just returns true or false. But notice that we have the word graduate here and here. So it occurs, it, it, it happens more than once within the string. If I want to find every single occurrence, what I can do is I can call a separate function called find all. I give it the pattern that I'm searching for, and that's going to return back a list. So when I run this, it will say, OK, yes, it did match. And the second case is just going to return back all of the matches. Now, since this is a very simple, uh, you know, a literal string with no special uh, wild cards or anything like that, they're all going to be identical. So that's not as useful. What we want to do in this case is we want to say, all right, I know you have that that substring occurs multiple times. I want to know where in the original string that it it comes. So instead of calling find all, I can call find iter. And what find iter will do is it will return back the string, plus it will also tell me where it started, where it ended, and so forth. So if I run this again, so then it shows me that the word, the substring graduate occurs starting at uh, five. So that would be zero, one, two, three, four, five and it ends at 13, and then 
also 32 up to 40. Uh, one of the things that you can do in a regular expression is you can say, all right, I need this uh, substring that I'm searching for. I need this to uh, not be a part of a larger word um, that starts before it. I need it to be the very beginning of the whatever word we're matching. So um, this pattern here, when I search the, the string, I'm going to search for this substring here, but it has to start at the beginning of a word. So we run this again. And in that case, we get uh, only one case, all right? Because it doesn't match this one here, because this was not the beginning of a word. And it doesn't match this one here, because this one has a capital G. But what if I don't care if, they, if the, the first letter is an uppercase or lowercase g, if I want to uh, match against either case? Well, in that case, I can use uh, what's called the character class. And inside of the square braces, I, I say either this one or that one. This matches one particular character, and it can be any one of the, uh, the options inside of here. So when I run it, it's going to match both lowercase graduate and uppercase graduate. All right, now we have uh, quite a few other, you know, a few more examples. Uh, feel free to go through those. And if you have more questions, um, you can, uh, you know, um, I'll, you go ahead and unmute yourself and or raise your hand and, and talk in the chat. If you have any questions about the content, uh, this is being recorded, and we will uh, upload the uh, this to our YouTube channel within about uh, a week and a half or so, is, us is usually how long it takes. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, you can always write to uh, help at, at hprc.tamu.edu, uh, send us questions, and... Uh, and if you would, uh, we have a, uh, a, uh, a short survey. If you could fill that out, that's very helpful to, to give us some feedback. And thank you very much. Oh, don't forget, uh, we also have, we have, uh, next week we have, uh, we have Scientific Python, the same time next Friday. Uh, later today we have Drug Docking with Schrodinger. Uh, and we also have two uh, MATLAB sessions next Wednesday, which is, uh, and these are going to be um, run by uh, an external unit. But uh, you're, you're free to uh, attend those as well. And then we also have a, uh, a, another short course. Uh, it's a technology lab, uh, how to use uh, AI frameworks within the Jupyter Notebook, the one that we just used. So that will be on uh, next Friday in the afternoon.